I don't get to be home very often. And last year, uh, I was on the road 48 weeks out of the year. And someone asked me this morning, Scott, we've been praying for you. How have things been going? And I want to tell you, in the last 12 months, we've seen almost 20,000 people come to know Jesus Christ all over America. And so the gospel is still the power of God. And God's not dead. He ain't even sick. Amen? He's alive and He changes lives. And all of us have an innate sense of the reality of God. We all know there's a God. And we all know that there's more to this life than this life. And that's why every time there's a movie that comes out or a television program that comes out that deals with the afterlife, have you noticed how popular those kinds of shows are? There's a new show called Resurrection. And of course, one of the most popular movies last year was based on a book that was a mil million seller, a bestseller, about the life of a little boy named Colton Burpo. Did you see that movie, Heaven is for Real? And people lined up, and it was the talk of the evening news, and they wrote editorials and newspaper articles about Colton Burpo and his story of dying and experiencing heaven. And he came back to say heaven is for real. Now, I don't know if Colton Burpo story is really real and authentic. I have a feeling that it is. But I know one thing. There's one authority on the subject and the place that the Bible calls heaven and what he says is really for real. And Jesus said heaven is for real. And I want to talk to you for just a few moments about what the Bible says about the place called heaven. Because all of us are going to live, listen to me, all of us are going to live forever. Did you know that? Do you know you've been created in the image of God? And that means that you are eternal. Just as long as God has breath because he breathed into the nostrils of man and man became a living soul. And that means that you're going to live as long as God has breath. And that's a long time. Amen? And so the most important question you can ask yourself this morning is if your heart stopped beating today. Do you know for sure where you'd go? Now, men have always had a kind of fear and fascination with death and the afterlife, and we've always wanted to live forever. Some of the oldest pieces of literature known to man, books like the Egyptian Book of the Dead and the Hindu Vita, deal with the issue of death and the afterlife. Matter of fact, the oldest book in the Bible is the book of Job. And in Job chapter 14, verse 12, Job asked the question, If I die, will I live again? When the explorers came to this continent, the Spanish conquistadores, they were searching for the fountain of youth. They wanted to live forever. And that's because God has put eternity in our heart. Walt Disney, the father of animation, the famous founder of the Disney empire, had his body frozen, captured in time. And he was in hope that the science of cryogenics would somehow evolve and develop to the point where they could unfall Walt and he could live again. All of us want to live forever. And the good news is you can live forever in a wonderful place the Bible calls heaven. Amen? So I want you to take your Bible and turn to John's Gospel. Everybody with a Bible? And if you don't have a Bible, just look on with someone who might be sitting around you and look at John's Gospel chapter 14, and I'm going to read out loud, beginning in verse number 1, John chapter 14, what did Jesus have to say about heaven? Because the Bible says that Jesus came down from heaven. The Bible says after he died on the cross and rose from the dead that he ascended up into heaven. The Bible says he's in heaven right now preparing a place for us. And one day he's going to come from heaven and take us to heaven. And one day heaven is going to come to the earth. And the entire creation is going to be healed because of the power of Jesus Christ. And so when Jesus talks about heaven, listen to me. For heaven's sake, listen to the words of Jesus. John chapter 14 verse 1. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. Now look right here for just a moment. Some of you 
have a troubled heart this morning. For some of you, it was all you could do just to get up when the alarm clock went off and put your clothes on and make your way to church because your heart's troubled. You have a troubled heart because of some news that you've just received, because of health problems, or maybe some of your, your family, your kids are literally breaking your heart. You didn't get much sleep last night because children that you raised in the house of God have turned their back on God and they're far away in the far country and your heart's troubled. Or maybe your heart is troubled because you don't know how you're going to pay next month's rent. But Jesus said, listen to me, he said you don't have to have a troubled heart. And then he said if you believe in God, how many of you believe in God? Let me see your hand, you believe in God. I think all of us believe in God. You know, I travel all over the world and I've met very few people who do not believe in God. You're about the little schoolboy named Johnny. Johnny was a Christian. He was always talking about God, but his teacher didn't believe in God. And often she would stand Johnny up in front of the class and ridicule Johnny and make fun of Johnny. And one day she stood Johnny up and said, so Johnny, you believe in God? Johnny said, yes, ma'am, I do. And the teacher said, well, Johnny, have you ever seen God? And Johnny said, well, no, I've never seen God. And she said, sit down, Johnny. There's no such thing as God. And Johnny's little friend named Susie was sitting next to him, and she raised her hand, and she said, Teacher, can I ask Johnny a question? And she said, Go ahead. And she said, Johnny, do you believe in the teacher? And Johnny said, Yes. And Johnny said, uh, Susie said, Johnny, do you, do you believe the teacher has a brain? And uh, the Johnny said, Yes. And Susie said, Well, can you see the teacher's brain, Johnny? And Johnny said, no. And she said, well, according to what the teacher says, the teacher has no brain. Amen? And I think people who don't believe in God just don't have a brain. All of us believe in God intuitively, innately. And Jesus said, listen to me, he said, if you believe in God, believe in me. Now, that's an audacious claim that Jesus is making. You understand what Jesus is saying. Listen to me. He's saying, believe, if you believe in God, then you can believe in me. Listen, because I am God. That's what Jesus is claiming. Now, I was on an airplane not long ago, and I was talking to a lady that was very sophisticated, very well-dressed, and as the plane took off, after we'd been in the air for about 10 minutes or so, the, the airplane hit a pocket of turbulence and began to rock back and forth. And I looked over at the lady. Her eyes were as big as saucers. And I said, if this plane goes down right now, I'm ready to go. How about you? Then I began to talk to her about Jesus and how he had changed my life and what he had done in my life. And after a few moments, the plane kind of leveled out. And she, I guess she got tired of listening to what I had to say because she put up her hand rather patronizingly. And here's what she said. She said, oh, I believe in Jesus. And then she said, but I also believe in Buddha. And she said, I believe in Muhammad. And I believe in Krishna. And she said, I believe in all the religious leaders and the great philosophers who have ever lived throughout time. And she said, I believe there are many ways to God. And I said, you know, there's a Greek word for that, baloney, amen? Because the Bible, listen to me, is clear that Jesus is more than a prophet. He's more than a teacher. He's more than a miracle worker. Jesus is God come in the flesh. He left heaven, listen to me, and stepped down the starry steps of eternity into time and wrapped his deity up in flesh and the creating one became the cradled one. The infant was at the same time the infinite God. Listen, Jesus is God. And Jesus said, if you believe in God, believe also in me. And then he said, in my Father's house, look at it, and that's what heaven is. You know what heaven is the place, and by the way, heaven's not a state of mind or an ethereal, nebulous nothing. Heaven's not just a state of consciousness. Heaven, listen, heaven is a real place. Did you know that just as real as Fort Worth, Texas, or Dallas, Texas, I just got back from Sacramento, California, as real as every great city in the world, heaven is just as real, and I think it's more real. 
The Bible talks about heaven being a place where the streets are made out of gold and the walls are made out of jasper and the gates are made out of pearl and there are multicolor foundational stones and a crystal clear river and free, and trees that bear their fruit for the healing of the nation. Heaven is a real place. And all this became very real to me a number of years ago. Gene and I started a church in the early 90s in a living room that in nine years grew to over 1,500 people. And our church was full of young people. And I've always loved young people because I came to know Christ as a teenager in jail not far from here, downtown Fort Worth in Tarrant County Jail. It's where I came to know Christ. He radically changed my life. And so I've always loved young people. And so at our church, we had hundreds and hundreds of young people. And I'll never forget in June of 2002, our kids were going to go to camp just like our kids here at Turning Point will be going to camp in just a couple of months. And I'll never forget standing on Sunday morning in front of our church and saying, if you're a young person here and you're going to camp, I want you to come right here because we're going to pray for you. And 150 people came forward. And I laid hands on them and the church gathered around them. And I'll never forget looking into their faces and saying, you're going to have the greatest week of your life. I'll be down there on Wednesday and Thursday just to hang out. And I said, I can't wait till next Sunday when you stand before, many of you stand before our church and tell what Christ has done in your life. And so we prayed, and the next morning at 6 a.m., all those kids showed up at the church and got on two chartered buses and two vans and then a caravan of adults who were giving up their time to be with the kids at camp that week. At 7.30 that morning, I got a phone call that's just as real to me as if it had happened this morning. It was our youth pastor, Mark Moore. And he called and said, Pastor, you got to get here as quickly as you can. And I said, what's wrong, Mark? And I could tell that he was troubled as he began to weep and sob. And he said, Pastor, something horrible's happened. I said, Mark, don't play with me like that. Now, what's going on? And he said, Pastor, somehow one of the bus drivers lost control of the bus and slammed it into the concrete support of the overpass near Canton, Canton Texas on I-20. Our kids were going to Ruston, Louisiana, at Louisiana Tech University. And he said, Pastor, it has sheared off one side of the bus. And then he began to weep. He said, Pastor, our kids are laying all over the highway. And he said, I don't think that some of them are going to make it. And I got my car as fast as I could. I went and got my associate, and we began to make our way through the back roads from Garland out to I-20, and the police obviously had already gotten there, and the traffic was backed up for miles, and sheriff's deputies and local police and state troopers were so gracious, thank God for police officers, to escort us through that. And they brought me there, and I got out, and I looked around. The news helicopters were hovering all around, news reporters everywhere. I got out and began to walk through the bodies of our teenagers. And I heard moans and groans of kids saying, I want my mama. I want my mama. Broken bones everywhere, pools of blood everywhere. And then there were four of our kids who had sheets over them, and I knew what that meant. And the bus driver went out into eternity. Listen to me. You better listen to me. Heaven is real. Hell is real. Eternity is too long to be wrong about what you're going to spend, and Jesus can be all around you but not in you. I'm not asking you this morning if you're a member of a church. I could spit in hell right now and hit a church member right on the head. I'm not asking you if you're a member of Turning Point. Turning Point's a great church, but being a member of Turning Point Church is not going to get you to heaven. The issue is, do you really know Jesus? And I'm looking at men this morning in the face who need to quit playing games. You're gambling with your eternity. You're not saved, and you know it. Your wife prays for you, and she weeps over you, and you're one heartbeat away from heaven or hell. 86 people die every minute. 5,000 people die every hour. 122,000 people die every day. Every time I snap my fingers, somebody just went out into eternity. You're going to die one day. Are you listening to me? 
When you die, it's not going to matter how big your house is. Some of you are li living for things that are not going to matter. It's not going to matter what kind of car you drive. It's not going to matter how fat your bank account is or how much money you've got in your retirement account. Do you think any of that is going to matter when you close your eyes for the last time and drop your chin on a pulseless chest and we take your body and put it in a box and drop you six feet under and drop cold clods on you and chisel your name across the face of a tombstone and go in the, in the fellowship hall and eat fried chicken and potato salad and talk about what a great guy you were and you're going to either be in heaven or you're going to be in hell. And I want to tell you what's going to make the difference. Listen to me. Hell's hot. Heaven's sweet. Jesus makes the difference. That's why Jesus said, listen to me. He said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. Let me tell you, heaven is a prepared place for a prepared people. The issue is, are you prepared? Are you ready? Are you ready to meet God? Do you know for sure if you died right now where you'd spend eternity? Because there are only two sections in eternity, smoking and non. Amen? I mean, that's it. That's it. And it's too long to be wrong. And that's why Jesus spent so much time, listen to me, talking about death. Sociologists tell us that one of the three constant thoughts that go through the mind of people as they make their way through life is what's going to happen to me when I die. You're hardwired to think about eternity because eternity is really what matters. And Jesus said, in my Father's house are many dwelling places, many mansions. I'm going to go and prepare a place for you. He said, if this wasn't true, I wouldn't say it. And then Thomas said, Lord, we don't know where you're going. And how, will you, how can we know the way? And Jesus said, Thomas, I am the way. Jesus is the way. Without him, there's no going. Jesus is the truth. Without him, there's no knowing. Jesus is the life. Without him, there's no living. And if you're going to go to heaven, you're going to have to humble yourself. That's why Jesus said you've got to become like a little child. You ever notice that Jesus never told children to become adult-like? He told adults to become childlike. And if you've got to have God all figured out before you'll give Jesus your heart, then you're going to die and bust hell wide open because you can't figure God out. You have to come to God by faith. Do you understand what I'm saying? And believe that Christ left heaven for one reason. You know Jesus left for one reason? He left heaven for one reason. And that is to go to the cross and die in your place. Now, he was a great teacher like no one ever taught. Jesus taught with such power and authority, but he didn't really come to teach. He didn't really come to do miracles. He came to die. Listen, when Jesus left heaven, it was for one primary reason, and it was to go to the cross where they ripped his beard out by the roots and they cleared their throat and spit in his face and they beat him until his face was disfigured they cleared their throat. They spat on him. They put a crown of thorns on his head. They beat him in the head with a stick over and over again until the, crown, the thorns pierced his brow and blood spurted. His capillaries broke and bursted. And then they beat him. And then they nailed him nine-inch nails through his hands and feet. They raised him up high in the air and dropped the cross and a huge hole in the ground and when the bottom of the cross hit the bottom of that hole all his bones came out of joint why is Jesus dying listen to me he's not dying for anything he's ever done he's dying for one reason he's dying to pay the penalty for the sins of the whole world because the Bible says listen to me that all of us have sinned we've all fallen short that's why everybody needs a savior do you know there are some people that are going to go to hell not because of the bad things they've done, but because of all the good things they've done. There are some of you in this room because you've done good things and tried to live a good life and tried to keep the Ten Commandments. You think that all of those things that you've done are going to get you to heaven. Listen, man, you don't spell salvation D-O. It's not what you do. You spell it D-O-N-E. It's what Christ has done for you. And if you're going to go to heaven, listen, I'm finished. You're going to have to humble yourself. And that's what I'm going to ask many of you to do in just a moment. I'm going to ask you to humble yourself and swallow your pride. Step on your dignity. Take off your mask. Quit trying to be something that you're not. God knows who you are. He sees you in the dark. He knows everything you've ever done wrong. And he still loves you anyway. And he loved you so much that he gave his son to go to the cross and 
The one who knew no sin became sin for you so that you could be made right with God. And then they took Jesus' body down off the cross and put it in a huge hole in the ground and they rolled a big stone over the mouth of the tomb and they said, we're done with that loser. What was his fella? What was his name? Jesus, this itinerant carpenter, this would-be Messiah. We're done with him. The world has heard the last of him. But the Bible says three days later, early in the morning, on that first Easter that Mary, a former prostitute whose life had been changed by Jesus, came as one last act of devotion to anoint and embalm his body with spices. But when she got to the tomb, she found that the stone had been rolled away and the tomb was empty. And Jesus is not dead. He's alive. Listen, Jesus is alive. He's alive. And one day he's going to come again. I believe he could come back in our... I believe that we are the generation that will see Jesus come back. And the issue is this. Listen to me. If he came today, or if you died today, are you ready to meet him? I wish you could meet some of the kids that died in that tragic bus accident. I know many of you prayed because we were inundated. Is this... Tragedy became a national news story with tens of thousands of emails from all over America and literally all over the world. People saying, we're praying for you. And I wish you could have met some of those kids. Some of you are going to meet them in heaven. Michael Freeman was 14 years old. He died on that bus. Michael Freeman, like my son Josh, is 16, feels called into the ministry. Michael was 14. I'll never forget when he came up to me and said, Pastor, I want to be just like you, man. I want to get out of high school, then I'm going to go to Bible college, and I'm going to learn how to preach Jesus, and I want to win people to Jesus. At Michael Freeman's funeral, 277 of his classmates stood up and gave their life to Jesus Christ. He's in heaven. Lindsay Kimmons had only been saved for six months. Six months. In six months, she did more for Jesus than most of you have done in the last ten years. She won her mama to Jesus. She won her sister to Jesus. She was on the drill team at Naaman Forest High School. She brought the whole drill team to Jesus. And at Lindsay's funeral, over a hundred of her classmates gave their life to Jesus Christ. And I could go on and on and on and on. And I can't wait to see those kids. They didn't go to heaven because they were good kids. They went to heaven because they placed their trust in Jesus Christ and what he did for them when he died on the cross. I'm going to see him again one day. But as far as we know, and I'm finished, that bus driver that bus driver never knew Jesus. I'm going to ask you a question. How can you be so casual about your relationship with God when there's a real hell? How can you let days and weeks and months go by when you don't ever tell anybody about Jesus when there's a real hell? Jesus spoke three times as much about hell as he did about heaven. He said it was like the burning garbage dump outside of the city of Jerusalem, a place called Gehenna where they would take their refuse and trash the unclaimed bodies of the dead, and because there was always trash going into that garbage dump, the fire never went out, and the smoke was always ascending, and the worms never seemed to die. And Jesus said, hell's going to be like that, a place of outer darkness, a place of weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth, a place of vile association. Every murderer, every rapist is going to be there. But do you know who the Bible says is going to be there first? The cowardly and the unbelieving. You say, well, I don't believe in hell. Listen, you won't be there 10 seconds before it'll make a believer out of you and then it'll be too late be too late you better make a decision for Christ today as far as we know that bus driver he never knew Christ I picked up the phone and called his wife and I said to her listen we're not mad at you you can imagine the shame as this became a national news story and the toxologist reports were released that said the bus driver's body was full of methamphetamines and alcohol. He probably hadn't slept in days and somehow he dozed off, lost control of the bus and killed those kids. 
And I said to his wife, we're not mad at you. We love you. We forgive you and we forgive your husband. I just want to know one thing. Do you know Jesus? I had the privilege of leading his wife to Christ over the phone and then his daughter and then another daughter and then his son prayed to receive Christ. But as far as we know, the bus driver never knew Jesus. Listen to me. He's in hell right now. He's been in hell over a decade. He didn't go to hell because he was a drug addict. Listen, I was a drug addict. Jesus loves drug addicts. People don't go to hell because they're drug addicts or because he killed those kids. That's not why people go to hell. They go to hell because they never bow their knee and confess with their heart that Jesus is Lord, that he's the way and the truth and the life. That bus driver's been in hell over a decade. And in 90 more years, he'll be in hell a century. And then a millennium. And then a billion years and a trillion years. Listen to me. Forever and ever and ever throughout eternity in hell. In hell. I want to ask everybody in this room very quietly and very reverently to bow your head and close your eyes. And I want to ask you a question this morning. This is a solemn time. It ought to be a solemn time. Because you're going to spend forever somewhere in heaven or in hell. You say, well, Scott, I believe in God. Listen, the devil believes in God. The Bible says he trembles. Demons tremble. But that's not what's going to get you to heaven. Some of you, if you died right now, you'd miss heaven and go to hell by 18 inches. 18 inches from your head to your heart. Because you believe in your head that there's a God and you might even believe in Jesus and you might even believe that he died on the cross and rose from the dead. But have you ever given your heart to Jesus? Or are you playing games with God? I'd like to see the hand of every person in this room who says, Scott, if I died right now, I'm as sure for heaven as if I'd already been there a million years. I remember the day and the place and the time when I repented of my sin. I trusted Christ. If my heart stopped beating and I went out into eternity to meet God, I don't think I'm saved. I don't hope I'm saved. It's not maybe I'm saved. I'm not 95% saved. I'm saved to the bone. And I know it. If that's your testimony, lift your hand and lift both hands and just say out loud, thank you, Jesus. You ought to thank God. You ought to thank God in this place today.